Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm Anish Diyakhar, a member of the investment team here at Signia. I'll be looking at the global property market and some of the trends and developments that we've seen uh, you know, unfold over the year with the pandemic. And then also taking a look at the product that we have here at Signia to you know, gain low cost exposure to this asset class, the Signia Itrix Global Property 40 ETF. Just taking a step back and looking at you know, how markets have fared this year, we've seen substantial volatility uh, you know, local equity staging a bit of a comeback uh, over the last six months, but very much flat over the last 12 months, as measured by the all share. U.S. equity, you know, having a fantastic rebound uh, led by very high valuations, uh, especially in tech companies. Uh, local property, you know, mainly continuing the trend of the last couple of years, you know, having quite horrible performance. Uh, we see the, we saw the listed property index uh, returning, you know, close to negative 16% in Feb, and I think around 36% down in March. Uh, so really, the pandemic just further, you know, increasing the misery uh, of those property companies. And then, uh, in terms of global property markets, more than a mixed bag, uh, as we'll see, it really depends on your subsector exposure. We will take a look at that in a moment. So we've had this pandemic, uh, lots of new trends. Uh, it still remains to be seen how many of these new developments, you know, new preferences and so on will be temporary and how many will be permanent, you know, resulting in structural changes in the overall property sector. Uh, as with all things COVID, we've also seen quite an uneven impact on the companies. Uh, some sectors with minimal face-to-face -face interaction, uh, managing to, to weather the storm and uh, some companies really struggling. Uh, this is essentially looking at your home sales in the US. So, you know, residential property actually leading the rebound in the US. The graph on the left-hand side, uh, you know, indicating the jump in existing home sales in July. Uh, you know, really picking up and on the right hand side, uh, new homes. So those being completed, those still under construction and importantly, you know, the darker shaded area planned construction for the months ahead, really spiking. And of course, all of this is being driven by, you know, supportive monetary policy and, you know, unbelievably, uh, you know, strong rate cuts that we've seen. Um, so you know, you can get a 30 year fixed uh, mortgage for interest of under 3% in the US. And of course, this is all closely linked to some of the developments we've seen in other property sectors, you know, the office uh, subsector as well. Uh, definitely a contender for word or term of the year working from home. Um, as we saw uh, countries emerge from lockdown, uh, we did see some people returning to the office, but of course, uh, you know, not everyone is back yet and it remains to be seen how many will be going back. So there's definitely an expectation that uh, work from home is, is not something that will completely disappear um, and we'll expect to see greater flexibility around this uh, from companies in the future. Some of the trends we've seen emerge over the last couple of decades actually in, in property, specifically offices, uh, such as having, you know, less space per worker and a bigger emphasis on shared spaces, you know, your cafeterias, your entertainment areas, we're likely to see some of these trends reverse. Um, you know, we've also seen hot desk uh, policies being implemented. We certainly have them at Signia uh, so that people not in the office every day, um, you know, doesn't need a, a designated workspace in the office. And uh, we see, you know, employees rotating uh, desk usage. Of course, we've also noticed, you know, increased demand in the suburbs. So part of this residential uh, uptick as well, uh, people who are working from home, you know, no longer as concerned with uh, commuting to city centers um, and of course, some better value on offer in terms of having more space, especially, you know, if you need an office at home. All of these trends really are very quickly impacting demand uh, for property uh, demand levels. 
But of course, these are bricks and mortar you know, assets. So supply will be a bit slower to adapt um, and we'll likely see you know, which of these trends are permanent um, as time goes by. In a survey conducted by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, we, we look at the proportion of employed Americans working from home specifically because of COVID. This will exclude people who were working from home before the pandemic. It will of course also exclude unemployed uh, you know, Americans who have been laid off because of the crisis or who have been furloughed. You can see there was quite a, you know, a return to normality as time went by, but this has slowed to a certain extent. Um, it's entered more of a, a sticky level where it is now. So you know, we don't expect to see that uh, decreasing at quite such a high rate. Um, and on the right hand side, we have the top 10 industries with the highest proportion of employees working from home. So of course that uh, being led by a computer and mathematical employees, you know, your tech sector, uh, everyone who just needs a, a laptop or a PC to work from home um, as at the end of September. And then some of the, the industries that we saw with you know, the lowest proportion of people working from home, you know, your typical sectors where you, you, you know, you can't sit at home working from a laptop. So construction, you know, farming and fisheries, those industries, around 2% of those employees uh, working from home. Taking a look at how this has evolved uh, over the last couple of months, uh, education, training and library personnel initially in May, you know, almost all of them working from home. And then as we saw schools being opened, um, you know, social distancing being implemented and so on, that has dropped dramatically. On the other hand, we've seen, you know, your, your tech sector, your computer and mathematical professionals really not, you know, changing too much. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, tech companies were some of the first ones to, to indicate you know, that this might be an indefinite policy. I know Twitter in, in March announced, you know, that they have no plans to return to pre-pandemic, uh, you know, office policies. It will be interesting to see how this plays out, you know, on demand for these uh, office buildings. Um, if you think of something like the tech sector and San Francisco, some of the most expensive real estate in the world there, uh, we can expect, you know, to see some changes around that and the demand for, uh, you know, central city real estate. Taking a look at how this asset class has performed year to date, um, on this graph we have uh, REIT indices and their yields uh, over time. Obviously your dividend yield is only one element of your total return, but for property companies, it's quite an important one. Uh, this graph specifically relates to REIT companies, so real estate investment trusts. It's a specific type of property company where you are required to pay off the majority of your earnings in the form of dividends uh, in return for favorable tax status. So once again, quite an important consideration. And you can really see North America, you know, dominating that level of yields for the last decade. Um, but of course, uh, more recently, you know, in 2020, you can see the price impact and the increasing yields on offer by these companies. Once again, just to put this in context, you know, taking your US REIT index uh, dividend yields, and comparing that to bond yields on offer, uh, as we saw central banks cutting rates, you know, throughout 2020, trying to provide support to the economy. Um, that would be your yield on a generic 10 year US government bond at the end of September, you know, around 68 basis points on offer as yield versus, you know, 4.3% uh, yield on your US REIT index. So, graph below just really indicating the relative yield pickup on offer uh, by these property companies. Uh, this table can seem like a bit of an information overload, but essentially it's just indicating some of the diversification benefits that are on offer from these property companies. The FTSE REIT All Equity REIT Index, you know, very broad, very all-encompassing uh, property index. 
and the correlation coefficient of that index with other you know, well-known equity market and bond market indices. What you can really see is you know, not a really strong positive correlation between these asset classes. Um, specifically, if you compare you know, the REIT index to something like the tech heavy NASDAQ 100, uh, quite weak positive correlations. Um, so a very important consideration uh, given some of these tech valuations that we've seen. The top right-hand side of the table is your coefficients over the last 10 years, um, a tiny bit higher than the lower left half of the table, which is over the last 30 years. But that's intuitive as we would have seen, you know, multiple market cycles over that period. And it just goes to show that over a longer period, those are even lower correlations. Uh, the real estate industry has also been undergoing some changes over the last, you know, many years. So although these companies are grouped together under one industry, um, they actually have very distinct supply and demand drivers. Um, and some of these companies with more exposure to the digital economy have actually fared quite well year to date, you know, putting on strong positive performance. Uh, and as these companies do well and some of these older industries, you know, don't do so well, we've seen a shift in the makeup of the overall industry. Uh, and even though we have seen a rebound in some sectors, a lot of the subsectors that have really struggled have not seen a big rebound yet. Um, you know, awaiting a bit more stability in the markets and maybe even, you know, a vaccine. These are some of your property classifications. So most of them self-explanatory, uh, diversified companies uh, don't derive their earnings, you know, more than 60% of their earnings from one uh, source of revenue. And interestingly, specialized companies, you know, broadly, they don't fit into any of the other buckets. Um, as we'll see, you know, one of the biggest new, uh, you know, subsectors in this industry falling under specialized, uh, namely data centers. If you were to have invested one rand in each of these subsectors uh, in 1993, uh, you can see where your money would have ended up. Obviously, the standout performer here is self-storage companies. Uh, these companies deal in relatively short-term lease agreements. So as we see you know, rising interest rate environments, as we've seen multiple times during that period, these companies are able to pass those on to their customers a bit quicker than you know, some of these other companies with very long-term lease agreements. You know, if you think of a mall, uh, you know, the type of lease agreements that they have. But if you compare this to the picture over the last five years, it's quite different. You'll see the emergence of these new so-called alternative subsectors, uh, you know, the label being ranked according to performance, infrastructure, industrial and data center companies doing very well over the last five years. Um, and some of your more traditional uh, sectors really lagging behind these others. Uh, to further break this down, if you compare the market exposure 20 years ago to, you know, what the industry is made up of now, you have your traditional sectors, industrial, apartment, retail, and office uh, real estate companies, and then you have these new so-called alternative sectors, cell towers, data centers, and so on. You can really see how this industry has shifted over the last 20 years. Uh, something like office companies making up almost a third of your exposure uh, 20 years ago, and now it's 7%. And if you look at cell towers, you know, not even being considered 20 years ago, now giving you one fifth of the industry's exposure. So we have seen rapid changes, uh, you know, coming for quite a while. Um, and all of this speaks to the dispersion of subsector performance that we've seen historically, but also especially this year. You know, industrial REITs really benefiting from the rise in e-commerce. So if you think of take a lot, um, all those goods you shop online need to be stored somewhere, warehouses and so forth. Uh, infrastructure really capitalizing on uh, the growth in you know, smartphone usage or any type of digital communication. Uh, travel and leisure companies being, you know, extremely hard hit by the pandemic, 
but these are activities that people you know won't give up so at some stage we will see a rebound and if anything you know the prices that these some of these companies are trading at are quite attractive uh, if you're a long-term investor business travel likely to lag leisure travel uh, just because you know businesses have been forced to adapt uh, using Zoom, you know, online meetings and so on, uh, we might see reduced demand for business travel for quite some time. And then healthcare, even though, you know, this is a subsector that really played a vital role during the pandemic in terms of hospitals and treating of uh, COVID patients, it has taken a knock as well. If you think about, you know, face-to-face -face interaction in terms of dentist visits, you know, there was none of that during lockdown. All elective surgeries had to be postponed and so on. This graph, uh, you know, just really driving home how uneven the impact has been on the property sector as a whole. So lodging resorts, retail, you know, those companies being extremely hard hit uh, by the pandemic. Home financing as people are laid off, you know, and they struggle to make their mortgage payments, those companies really struggling as well. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have these new, you know, so-called alternative uh, subsectors doing extremely well, even during the pandemic, you know, being fueled on by the pandemic, if you will. Uh, so data centers, infrastructure, industrial, self-storage, all of these uh, industries that we've seen really emerge over the last couple of years, actually having positive performance, uh, even with the pandemic. Uh, this graph almost, you know, a similar profile to what we just saw in terms of year-to-day performance, uh, really measuring your premium or discount to NAB. So these are listed companies um, with underlying, you know, bricks and mortar assets. So if you take something like a, a shopping center, um, it might be worth a hundred rand. And yet the share price of the companies that own that shopping center are trading at 60 rand. Um, really driving home the negative sentiment towards this industry um, and, of course, all of the uncertainty. And once again, you have your, your industries that are really capitalizing on this uh, pandemic, uh, you know, doing very well, trading at very high premiums um, and, you know, basically showing the momentum um, that's built up in these subsectors. So the Signia Itrix Global Property 40 ETF is the fund we have here at Signia that gives you very low cost exposure to global property as an asset class. If we take a look at uh, how the fund is uh, managed and put together, it tracks the S&P Global Property 40 index. Um, and this is a bit of a, a more concentrated index as we'll see in a moment. It focuses on, you know, large cap companies, you need to have at least a billion dollars in market cap, you need to be very liquid in terms of, uh, you know, your share liquidity, uh, minimum three month average daily traded value of $3 million. This fund focuses specifically on developed markets, so no emerging market exposure, you know, you need to have positive earnings and have paid a dividend over the last year to be eligible for inclusion. Uh, this this index specifically caps uh, the amount of constituents at 40. So, you know, at any point in time, this fund will hold 40 underlying companies and they will be weighted according to their market caps. There are some modifications in the form of free float, et cetera, uh, just once again to improve the liquidity of these underlying instruments that are included. And then we also cap exposure to any individual constituent at 10%. So, you know, really reducing your, your, your risk of being overexposed to any single company. Uh, and then this index is rebalanced semi-annually, so our next rebalancing coming up in November. And very important, all of this, you know, is provided at a very low cost of, you know, 24 basis points. So a total expense ratio for this fund of 0.24%. Um, and even though your underlying exposure is to, you know, this global offshore asset class, uh, this fund is listed on the JSE, meaning, you know, you're not using up your foreign exchange allowance, it's all in ZAR. Comparing, you know, the more concentrated index that the fund tracks to 
some of the more broader indices really drives home how beneficial uh, you know, focusing on these quality, uh, large cap, very liquid companies has helped the fund's performance year to date. Um, so we have the S&P developed property index, which I guess you can see uh, as sort of a parent index to the S&P property 40 index, um, having, you know, north of 500 constituents. And then we also compare, uh, you know, the S&P Global X US index, also including some emerging market exposure, 650 plus constituents uh, in that index. And as you can see, having less exposure to these really cyclical subsectors has really helped the fund. So an investor would have benefited from having a bit more uh, concentrated exposure in the Signia ETF. Um, you know, having no exposure to hotel and resort REITs, less exposure to offices and less exposure to retail REITs, um, you know, bringing you to a differential of 4.6% relative to the parent index year to date, um, as these companies are able to, you know, better manage the pandemic. Once again, just doing a, a comparison, the graph on the left hand side, uh, being compared to the broader, you know, 500 plus constituent index, um, you know, the two indices moving in tandem up until the moment that the pandemic hit, uh, and then the more, you know, concentrated index, the S&P Global Property 40, ending, you know, September on top as these companies are better able to, you know, weather the COVID storm. And on the right-hand side, just taking a look at how, you know, developed market property companies have performed relative to emerging market companies, um, we've seen emerging markets, you know, really struggle to, to get a hang of, you know, the, the infection rate and in treating these patients. And once again, the S&P developed index performing better uh, year to date. Uh, some of the new or so-called alternative indices really making up uh, the majority of the funds. So specialized REITs, as we said, those data centers and so on, Industrial REITs also benefiting from uh, the rise in e-commerce, you know, those warehousing companies. Residential REITs, as we saw, you know, really uh, leading the rebound in the property markets in the US. Um, some diversified real estate activity companies and so on. And of course, very little exposure to uh, office REITs or retail REITs and no exposure to hotels and resorts. These are the five largest holdings in the fund as of the end of September. Um, and of course, looking at how they've performed year to date. So Prologis, uh, a logistics company, once again, e-commerce coming into the fray. Um, it, it's classified as an industrial REIT, uh, returning you know, almost 13% year to date. And you know, this company really goes to show the focus on some of these large cap liquid companies. It operates across uh, 800 million square feet, you know, in 19 countries, so an enormous uh, company. Equinix and Digital Realty Trust, two of the more interesting companies, as we mentioned, these data centers, um, you know, your Facebook photos need to be stored somewhere, any type of cloud computing, uh, you know, these companies really capitalize on those opportunities. Uh, so both of those, you know, performing uh, north of 20% year to date. Uh, Venovia is what you would associate more with a traditional property company operating in Germany and Austria. You know, they do rentals and some value added services, but the company also doing very well year to date, you know, delivering 22% in euros. And then as we saw, you know, over the longer term graph, um, the self storage facility company is doing very well, public storage, or one of these. Um, mainly focused in the US, uh, operating across 40 states um, and returning, you know, almost 5% year to date, even with the pandemic. This is your, uh, you know, your currency breakdown, but also your geographical breakdown for the fund. As with any developed market index, uh, you know, a lot of exposure to the US. Um, of course, a lot of exposure to developed Asian uh, geographical companies, um, some exposure to Asia Pacific in the form of, uh, you know, Australian property companies, and then, of course, your European uh, exposure. 
And on the right hand side, I've just included, you know, the policy rates of these companies included in the fund as at the end of last year to where they were in September, we saw, you know, dramatic rate cuts from countries with scope to cut rates. Um, you know, the US, Australia and the United Kingdom really leading the charge. Um, of course, you know, you have the Eurozone with a 0% nominal rates um, and in reality having negative real rates or a country like Japan with a negative nominal rate and even, you know, further negative real uh, rates. And all of these rate cuts really benefit these property companies in terms of these companies, you know, being able to service their debt obligations. So obviously, you know, having a lower interest rate on that debt and property companies generally uh, quite, quite reliant on debt capital funding. And another way is, of course, the underlying assets of these companies getting a valuation boost from these lower rates. If you think of the cash flows on those underlying assets being discounted, at lower rates, you know, you get to a higher valuation. Looking at some fundamental uh, ratios on the index that the fund tracks, you know, providing you with a dividend yield of 3.6% in dollars. Um, and then importantly, if we look at the 12 month trailing price to earnings ratio relative to your estimated one year forward PE, you can see a lower ratio. So essentially you're paying less for every uh, rand worth of earnings um, and the graph at the bottom indicating your price to book value forward looking ratio. So once again, estimates. Um, and even though we've seen that ratio increase from the pandemic levels in March to where we are now at the end of September, uh, you know, it's still better value on offer compared to where some of those levels were at the end of last year. This price is really taking a knock, um, but you know, you know, as I said, better value. In closing, uh, you know, these are very volatile, uh, very uncertain times. We still don't know how most of these trends will play out over the longer term. But, you know, quality property that's in demand with attractive yields will continue to be, you know, sought after. Um, we'll see some of the consumer facing sectors you know, continue to struggle until we have a vaccine. Um, but as with all things COVID, you know, it's accelerated some trends that were coming years before the pandemic. So we see, uh, you know, the makeup of the industry really changing, tilting towards some of these newer, you know, alternative subsectors. We also saw that, you know, it's important to remember that REITs offer diversification benefits. You know, you don't see strong po positive correlations with uh, equities or bonds, and that can help your portfolio, you know, possibly improve its risk adjusted performance by having these lower correlations. You know, inflation hasn't really been a concern for most investors, uh, you know, the last while it's bound to return at some point. And property has also has always been, you know, a valuable inflation hedge, you know, another benefit to this asset class. Um, and as, as we take all of this in, uh, it's remembered to it's important to remember that at you know at its core real estate exists to provide shelter and facilitate commerce so as much as you know something like the pandemic will influence our preferences um, in terms of where you prefer to live or where you prefer to work etc uh, these needs won't disappear and something like the signia ETF uh, that we have, you know, giving you exposure to some of these new subsectors, really focusing on high quality and very liquid companies, uh, you know, providing attractive yields uh, at attractive prices uh, can really help any portfolio weather some of the storms we've seen and, you know, provide attractive yields. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions, please do send them through and uh, have a great day further, everyone. Thank you.